She's already gone through this. Now this is two. How many times? I mean, I'm 48 years old. I've never seen anyone in my lifetime get shot. I mean, what are the odds? So I went down, and <laughs> I find out that she's the one being charged with it. I can't tell you how, <laughs> how bad that hurt. <laughs> to know my daughter was involved. And a man's life had been taken. <laughs> It became known as the show and tell murder. Right. How did he get that name? The girl was in high school at the time, and I was, and I had already dropped out of school. Uh, she had some girlfriends from school that, that she knew, uh, that they both knew the man prior, and, you know, kids kind of, I don't know, brag about what happens, you know, remember that guy, and. Well, he's, you know, dead out in the desert, and, you know, they don't believe her. So she decided to take him out there and, and see the guy, and that was kind of the way it went down. The night after Cotton was shot, the next morning, I had gotten up to go to school. Um, I didn't know if this had happened to me or was I just thinking this happened to me. I wasn't really sure, and so... I went back to the scene of the crime, and um, I seen it from the side of the road. <sighs> but it still wasn't real. Teenager Sandy Shaw testified in her own defense today, staring only at her attorney. Shaw explained how last September, she and two older boys drove into the desert with a Canadian man. After the first shot, cotton moaned and hit the ground. And there was another shot. And then Billy yelled, get him now, Troy, get him now. And at the same time that was being said, there was two more shots. What did you do? There was nothing I could do. It was all behind. It was everything was behind me. I was on the ground. It was all behind me. What, what did you do? I was screaming. At the trial, they told the jury not to uh, allow my um, angelic looks to fool them. That the person I appeared to be was not who I really was. That in fact I was um, a cold-blooded killer. How did that make you feel? At the time, um, I really didn't feel anything. Through that whole time of my life, I really didn't feel nothing. How do you feel you feel me or not guilty? Not guilty. <clears throat> and uh, charging you with conspiracy, you commit robbery, conspiracy, you commit murder, robbery, and use of a deadly weapon, and murder, and use of a deadly weapon. How do you plead guilty or not guilty? Not guilty. They offered me a life with the possibility of parole on a plea agreement. And being stubborn and kind of thinking I knew everything at the time, I didn't take it. I thought that 10 to 15 years was the rest of my life at 18 years old. And uh, in reality, it's not. You know, you can start over again. I made a decision when I walked in the gate that I was going to come in there as a man and I was going to leave as a man. I wasn't going to resort to things that a lot of people in my situation had to do to survive in prison. I wasn't going to suck dick. I wasn't going to wash people's laundry. I wasn't going to 
tell on people. I wasn't going to fall into that structure to survive in my environment. I kind of took responsibility at that time that I got myself in the situation. Now deal with it. I was fortunate in the sense of some older guys seen that, that I had a lot of time to do and I stuck up for myself so they kind of put me under their wing on schooling me, on showing me who was who on the yard and what to stay away from, don't get in gambling debts, don't get in any kind of drug debts. You have predators, you have homosexual predators, you have extortionists, and uh, a whole ball of wax, and they're going to test you. One incident, I, I ended up getting uh, shot and stuff like that on the yard and with a guy that was a notorious booty bandit. It was an older guy, uh, a black guy, I can't even remember his name, homosexual predator. I was 19 and, and this guy was in his late 40s and uh, we were on the yard and it came to either, you know, he says, if you want respect, you're going to have to come and get some respect. So I had to make sure that that wasn't going to be tolerated. That meant that you, you battled for it. They break it up by by shooting uh, rounds at you from the waist. It's called skip rounding. I mean, it stopped the fight. It blew me off my feet, you know, because, I mean, you're getting shot by a 12-gauge you know, shotgun from, like, 30 feet away. So it, it blew me off my feet, and, you know, the fight was over after that. When I arrived at prison, I came, I came to prison for forgery. I forged a $300 check. That's what I was in prison for. I was serving a sentence of a 1 to 15. I wasn't placed in like a minimum security prison for forgers. I was placed in a super maximum security prison for murderers. Eric Daniels was a co-defendant to Troy Kell and in fact uh, was the individual during the homicide that laid across the victim's leg so as to incapacitate the victim from moving. Uh, he, the ironic thing, had been sent to prison uh, on a zero to five, somewhat minimal forgery case, uh, where he had actually taken a check from a local sheriff here, which was his first mistake, and then forged the sheriff's name on his check. Um, not a bright idea. Sent him to prison for zero to five. So Rick Daniels went from a small time crook to never going to see the light of day outside of a prison again. Here I am, a forger, living on death row. I was coming, I was interacting and, and recreating with, with three guys that were, that had death sentences that were going to be executed within the next three or four years, and I'm in prison on forgery. That's how I ended up be, um, becoming involved in violent situations. I felt my only avenue for relief was to lash out against the authority. And that's, that's how I became involved with the riot. Don't tell me nothing yet. And we got a deal. Until they fucking fulfill their part of the deal, we ain't racking in. Regardless. You feel slighted by the system because you're there in the first place. Okay? And then that builds. Okay? And that anger turns into resentment and then absolute bitterness. We want our fucking mail. Sorry, guys. I don't think they're right. Senator Baum and Daniel. See, that was impressive. <laughs> no way. Attention, all inmates in Cedar Section One. Return to your cells now or extreme force will be used against you. Return to your cells now and lock up 
or force will be used against you. They're coming. He's coming through. They're going to break that door. Yeah, they are. No. <coughs> the caps are coming off. Hey, they're they're going to take the door. door here. Okay, now what are they going to do? The salad board has been breached. SWAT. Can you guys get out there? Echo 102. Echo 102. Yeah, the uh, Sally Port oh, section door has been breached. You start to think that the officer that's holding you there, the one that comes and feeds your tray every day, is evil. First thing that comes to most people's minds is lash out, do something violent. Back up, dude. Back up. Get out of that hall. The water's off. Oh, yes. Yeah. Watch the door. Get your camera turned on. You're in your cell for so long, by yourself, you have no television, no radio, very little contact with the outside world. You develop different symptoms of mental illnesses. Paranoid schizophrenic, anxiety disorders, impulsive behaviors, and because you have absolutely nothing to do in there all day long, I plotted and planned on what I was gonna do to the administration when I got out of there. I, I threw some urine and some uh, feces on her uh, because I couldn't do anything else to her. I couldn't get my hands on her. And so I, I, that was the next best thing. It made me feel uh, uh, on top of the world to, uh, s to see her running out of the unit, uh, screaming, you know, screaming her head off uh, with feces in her hair and her face. I got a phone call. Um, from uh, some official in Utah. Um, I don't remember his name, uh, but I was, you know, they just told me that, uh, that my brother had been attacked by another inmate and uh, that he was dead. Uh, and I immediately called my dad and my mom. And, you know, you just, just don't want to believe it. You don't want to believe that someone that you someone that you love is gone. <sighs> this was a a victim who had a quite storied past in Arkansas, had been in trouble with the law, including armed robbery, uh, had some violent tendencies in Arkansas, and in fact had committed some assaults on guards in Arkansas, committed assaults on inmates in Arkansas. I want to paint a pretty picture of my brother because he was that he was a, he was a maximum, maximum security risk, is what he told me. And, and I found out after his death that uh, he was in lockdown. Originally, we didn't have any idea why the killing took place. As we got into the case more and more, we did more investigation. One of the more startling aspects of the case was that this was really just some racial hatred. The comments that Troy Kell made at, immediately after the killing. And that he was really quite proud of himself, that, you know, that this black in person would no longer be around, that he couldn't uh, talk about white women, certain comments like that, that he was really, uh, seemed very proud of himself, that there was one less African American on the earth and that that was something good. I would classify myself as a separatist, though. That's, I, I believe that, that uh, the white man should return to Europe and should have never came over here. Throughout history, if you see the Greeks or the Romans or, or any civilization that started the Egyptians, that started to uh, 